Okay. So um, we're very pleased to have Prof Professor Brad Duchesne with us today in our seminar. Professor Duchesne has a BA in psychology from Marquette University. He then did a PhD in psychology at UC Santa Barbara under the supervision of Lida Cosmides. I hope I'm pronouncing her name correctly. Uh, this was followed by a postdoc at Harvard with Ken Kayama, where he already started to investigate face perception and face perceptual deficits. And that's when the uh, uh, Cambridge face memory test uh, was developed. He continued to a position in London at UCL, where we actually met then and were situated at the same building at the ICN. He worked on atypical face perception and deficits to quantitatively and qualitatively estimate face perception abilities in the general population. At the time, he collaborated with Martin Amer, John Driver, Sarah Blakemore, and others. He then moved to Dartmouth College, where he is now faculty and a full professor of, psycholo of psychological and brain sciences. And he is now also the chair of the psychological and brain sciences department. He won multiple awards and honors, commending both his research and his teaching. He gave numerous keynote lectures on top of dozens of invited talks. His research and worldwide collaborations are continuously funded. His research is often covered by the popular media, including 60 Minutes, New York Times, Times Magazine, Wall Street Journal, and many other television shows, newspapers, radio, and magazines. He has more than 12,000 citations, published more than 100 papers, probably more, uh, published in top leading journals, including Trends in Cognitive Neuroscience, Current Biology, PNAS, Annual Review of Vision and Science, Current Opinion in Neurobiology, and many others. He leads the Social Perception Lab and also um, developed the faceblind.org website. His lab uses multiple methods, including neuropsychology, psychophysics, neuroimaging, to explore the cognitive, neural, developmental, and genetic basis of social perception with a focus on face perception and prosopagnosia, or face blindness. And today, as I understand, we will hear about another face perception deficit that I'm not familiar with, and I, I assume many others are not. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome you, Brad, to our seminar series uh, to present your novel and exciting research. Thanks for joining us. Thanks a lot, Sharon. That was a very nice introduction. I sort of feel important after that. I appreciate that. Um, I appreciate um, you giving me the talk to, uh, or giving me the opportunity to talk here today as well, uh, because I'm going to be talking about a new line of research in my lab that um, we sort of stumbled into a couple of years ago, but now we're trying to to do a lot more of it. And I'm hoping it can sort of become maybe maybe the main focus of the research in my lab. I don't know if that's actually gonna be possible or not, just in terms of being able to find people with this condition, but um, it's a condition I'm really fascinated by. Um, and it, it's a term that's a real mouthful to say, so it's prosopometamorphopsia. And so from here on out, I'll refer to it as PMO. Um, and um, what we're talking about in PMO, how can I advance this? Um, is people see faces as distorted. Um, for them, we're using sort of a, a, a two different types of, we, we talk about two different types of PMO, one full face PMO, in which people see distortions to the entire face when they look at it. Um, and then there's also hemi PMO, um, in which distortions are to one side or the other of the face, um, so that the vertical midline appears to play an important role uh, or be an important sort of um, distinction within face representation. So um, for hemi-PMO on the right, you can see um, the, the features, it was only the features on the right side of this face, whereas with PMO on the left, it's features on the left side. In, in some cases, um, it's not even sort of the whole half of the face, it's even just particular features that are distorted. So it might be the, the left eye only, or it might be the right side of the mouth. Um, and so there's a lot of different ways that these distortions can manifest themselves. Um, just to give you a feel for the sorts of distortions that you can see that I, I um, we first worked with a, a woman, um, say maybe around starting around 2011, who had full face PMO. And, um, she, uh, we published a paper on her in 2014. And so here are just a few quotes. So we showed her this face and she said, wow, large nose, prominent eyebrows. The eyebrows are coming towards me. And strangely, his right eye is getting larger. 
like more. Yeah, both brows are coming towards me and his right eye is getting larger. Um, we showed him this guy here. She says his whole lower face and chin are almost ballooning and his left eye is dropping, still dropping down. It's really weird. It's like, I can tell it's not moving because I can look at it and see that, but still it's moving down his face. And then we asked, do you get anything with ears? She said, ears don't really bother me. I guess they're not part of the face. So she's a psychologist. Um, she says, is, uh, is that the same guy I saw before, but turned to the side? Yeah, sideways doesn't really bother me. And we've collected some data recently from um, patient AS here showing that she doesn't get distortions once faces get to a certain viewpoint. Um, and then this slide, and some of you might recognize this face here. This is Peter C from about 25 years ago when he was a graduate student. Um, she says, yes, his left eye is doing something really weird. It's hard to, it's one of those, I can't describe what it's doing. I mean, his other eye is playing along. I can't read the rest of this because the controls are here. Let me see if I can hide these. You can probably read it just fine, but uh, hide floating. There we go. I mean, his other eye is playing along. So it's like one eye you know, it's defined physics and his upper lip is going out and down, kind of distending. And so this gives you a feel for the sorts of distortions um, that people with PMO have. Um, here's hemi-PMO and these are drawings um, that were made by people who have hemi-PMO. Some of these I was looking at last night, it's a little hard to know exactly which side of the face is distorted. But um, for example, this face here on the side, you can see that the nose is, um, angled out here to the right. The eye is, is stretched out here to the side of the face. Same with the mouth. Um, it seems that there, there's the, the most common sort of distortion that you get are features kind of drooping down. Um, um, here we see a face. This face is distorted. This face on the, this, this side is distorted. Um, and I'll show you some more, some more data from people with hemi-PMO um, here later. Now, if you look, when we looked in the literature, there were about 25 cases of hemi-PMO um, that have been, report, have been reported. Now, interestingly, the majority of them have a lesion to the splenium. So that's the posterior corpus callosum. And so a lot of these cases result from transmission problems. You can see over here, here's the lesion in this particular case here. Um, so it's a problem with transferring information from one hemisphere to the other. Um, in most cases of hemi-PMO, the distortions are limited to faces. Um, I can think of a case that Grusser and Landis studied where um, the person had distortions to one half of the face and then also they had them to the corresponding hand, but interestingly, not to the other hand. Um, the, in a lot of these cases, though, there hasn't been a lot of... Um, uh, a lot of non-faces have not been presented to the people. So I think it's... We, we should be cautious sometimes as to how face specific these distortions are, but certainly in most cases, the only thing that's apparent to the people are distortions to faces. Um, and then interestingly, most of these cases don't report that they have difficulties with face recognition or with other face tasks. Um, now, part of that might be that they're able to use the undistorted half of the face to do the task that they need to do. Um, and um, it would be not, there haven't been enough tests of, uh, in which just the distorted half of the face is presented and um, see whether then they have difficulties with these sorts of tasks. So that, that's something we're interested in looking into here. Um, so I, I first got interested in PMO and hemi-PMO uh, when I was a postdoc. And um, then when I moved to London, I got in touch with somebody who had hemi-PMO, an, an Italian patient. And I thought I was gonna have the opportunity to test that person. So I did a lot of um, background reading on hemi-PMO. And one of the things that, I, that was pretty obvious as I was reading it is that there seemed to be a relationship between the lesion location and the part of the face that was distorted, um, which was a real surprise to me. Um, and so here, here's just the data that we've collected. I think that we've actually got one more here now in this left hemisphere um, lesion group. But one of the sort of perpetual confusions we have when talking about hemi-PMO is what's left and what's right. And this is a problem in the literature. So when I'm talking about left, 
I'm always going to be talking about faces on the left. One, one sec, let me just, um, hey, hey, Professor, can you stop talking? Um, uh, when I'm talking left, it's going to be sort of the part of the face that's typically in the left visual field, and right is the part of the face that's typically in the right visual field. Um, and what you can see here is um, if people have a lesion to the left hemisphere, um, in none of those cases, these are unilateral cases, there are a fair amount of cases where we don't know sort of where the lesion is, but um, in, in all those cases, it's always the right half of the face that's distorted. Um, if we look at cases that have a unilateral right lesion, you see that um, two thirds of them have the left half of the face distorted and a third of them have the right half of the face distorted. Um, and so this, is, this really intrigued me. And you know, one possible explanation for this, and you know, we need more numbers to feel confident about this, but you know, it makes me wonder, well, maybe is the right half of the face initially represented in the left hemisphere and the left half initially represented in the right hemisphere. Um, and then um, interesting, if you look at the four full face cases who have unilateral lesions, they all have lesions in the right hemisphere. Um, and there was also one case that initially was, uh, had full face distortions. And then um, those distortions were limited just to the left half of the face. And so from that, you might say, well, okay, so maybe we've got the two halves represented initially in each hemisphere. And then the two halves are brought together in the right hemisphere. And so that's why we get the full face cases resulting from unilateral um, right hemisphere lesions. So I think that's a really interesting um, account of what's going on here. And for me, it was a, a new way of thinking about the way face processing might work to, to think about the two halves of the face as being represented um, independently from one another. But the data for this is pretty weak. Um, one of my graduate students, Sarah Harold, who's, who's done a lot of the work on PMO, was working on a, um, a literature review about the left hemisphere face areas. And the left hemisphere face areas, as, as some of you probably know, are, they're kind of a mysterious set of areas in that they're there, they show a response that's fairly close to uh, the size of the response that you'll see in right hemisphere areas, but it's extremely rare for um, patients who have unilateral left lesions to be prosopagnosic. So almost all the unilateral uh, lesion cases that are prosopagnosic, it's right hemisphere lesion. So it's, it's not clear what the left hemisphere face areas are, are doing. I mean, we've got some hints, but um, so Sarah was reviewing the literature on this and um, was really getting excited about this distinction that we were seeing within hemi-PMO. The problem is that the, most of the papers are brief medical case reports. Um, so they're typically one or two pages. And it's a neurologist who um, doesn't have much of a background within visual neuroscience, um, probably doesn't have a whole lot of time to work on the case. And so they just do a few measurements. They find that this person is showing this unusual um, uh, uh, these unusual distortions, and then they leave it at that. Um, and so they, in all the cases that had been published, um, it, it was possible that when we're seeing these half face distortions, they might be tied to the hemifield rather than to the face half. Um, and so no, fa no studies had presented faces out in the periphery to see, see if the distortions were affected by position. Um, and so Sarah and I were pretty, uh, we were kind of disappointed with the literature and um, frustrated that more of these sorts of uh, studies ha hadn't been done. And just about this time, it was, it was really an amazing coincidence. Um, I got an email from George Almeida and George is a, um, a cognitive neuroscientist who works in Portugal. And he'd gotten in touch with me because he was um, working with somebody with PMO um, and um, had written a paper about that person. And George had run all the experiments that we had hoped somebody would run with people with hemi-PMO. So he had presented, and I'll show you this data later, he'd presented the, the um, faces in the two different visual fields. He'd shown half faces. Um, he'd even shown faces rotated around to see whether did the distortions track particular facial features or particular um, parts of the stimulus. And um, 
So Sarah and I were really excited about this. I gave George's background is not within phase processing. And um, so he was just interested in my input. And I suggested that he, the, the, the emphasis in the paper was on the neural data. Um, but I thought what was really wonderful about this case study was the behavioral data. And so I thought he should, should emphasize that. Um, they resubmitted the paper as it was, emphasizing the neural data, it got rejected. And then a few months later, he sent me another email and he said, you wanna get involved in this? Um, he, th he thought that um, Sarah and I could help with the framing. And so we did that and we worked together on this paper. And in, um, in thinking about how to um, uh, frame uh, patient AD's case, um, we, we thought about reference frames. And um, so, of course, so early in the visual system, um, the reference frame, of course, is a retina-centered reference frame. Um, but then as you move along the ventral stream, um, the visual system starts using different sorts of reference frames. And it's not clear when it comes to phase processing just what those reference frames are. Um, and we were inspired by work that had been done on word representation by George's um, PhD supervisor, Alfonso Caramazza and Argyle Hillis um, 20 some years ago. And this is really fascinating work that they did on with people who had neglect dyslexia. And what they found in these studies is that there are two different levels of word representation. Um, one, one type of the representation is a stimulus-centered representation. The other is a word-centered representation. So when it comes to these stimulus-centered representations, uh, words are represented within a spatial reference frame um, in which the visual, can, in which you've got a visual configuration, but the position of the stimulus within the visual field is not represented. So it doesn't matter where the stimulus is presented, the person is still gonna say, show the same sorts of uh, neglect symptoms. And this is a little abstract. So let me just give you some examples here. So here's patient BPN, who they did a lot of work with. It suffered a lesion to the right temporal lobe, parietal lobe. And um, didn't matter where they presented the words, BPN experienced um, neglect with those words. So imagine BPN was given the word park. And then you say, OK, BPN, what word are you seeing? BPN might report back that they saw hark. Hang, they report Ming, Bask, they report Ask. So what you can see is that there's a problem with the start of the word here um, when these words are presented in a, in a normal format. Um, and so she's neglect. you'd say she's neglecting the, the left side or else the front of the word. Um, if you presented the, the letters or the words uh, as mirror images, so the mirror reversed here. So now here we've got Park. You say, what word are you seeing? What you'd find is that she's still making, she's still having difficulties with the end of the word. So um, here's park is red parks, hang is red ham, and uh, bay, basque is red base. I hope that's not too loud. My wife is grinding her coffee beans there. Um, and so uh, patient BPN is always having difficulties with the left side of the word. Sometimes the, the left side of the word might be the start of the word. Other times it might be the end of the word. Now this contrasts with a, a deficit um, involving a word-centered word representation. And so here again, it doesn't matter where within the visual field the word is presented, the patient is gonna have the same sorts of um, difficulties with, with reading that word. Um, but now it's not tied to a particular type of stimulus. So here's patient NG. Um, so this person had a, a left temporal and parietal lesion. And um, here are the examples with, uh, is it NG? NG, yeah. Um, so we've got humid and NG misreads that as humid. So difficulty with the end of the word, budge, budget, though, thoughts. And so you can see we're having, he's having difficulty with the end of the word and the right side of the word. So now we can go over here. Here's the mirror reversed. So of course these aren't really mirror reversed, but um, if these were mirror reverse, so the C's here, the N's here, and how does uh, NG do? Well, NG has difficulty with the end of the word. So now it's this part of the word, remember the N's here, the C's here, 
the end of the word that NG is having difficulties with. Discovery, NG has difficult, reads that as disco, join, join. They even presented the words in, say, vertical from bottom to top, fraud frame. Well, NG is having difficulties with the ends of the words again. Um, vertical top to bottom, blending is read as blemish. So again, the end of the word. So regardless of how the word was presented to NG, NG had difficulties with the end of the word. And so it wasn't a left-right thing um, like we saw for BPN, but rather a particular portion of the word that wasn't being represented properly. Um, and so she's got difficulties with the second half of the word. And so this reflects damage to a word-centered level of representation. Um, so that raised the question for us, does face processing involve similar levels of representation? Um, is there a stimulus-centered representation? And then um, after that, a face-centered representation. Um, and um, so those, those cases about word representation came from studies of neglect dyslexia. Uh, but there's only one case of facial neglect. And this is a case I've always thought was a really cool case that Andy Young and his colleagues um, published 30 some years ago. Um, so KL suffered a lesion uh, to the right occipital pole, has some visual field um, abnormalities, um, but um, KL noticed that faces looked unusual and he had trouble recognizing them. Um, so here are a few quotes from KL. So. Uh, or this is from the paper directly. His spontaneous complaint was that faces looked different and that the eyes in particular seemed to be misplaced. Even his wife looked different. Though he added he was beginning to get used to this. Um, when describing slides of faces, KL sometimes maintained that they look like montages of two different people joined at the vertical midline. For some of these montages, he felt that one side was familiar, but the other side was not, or that the eyes were looking in different directions. Um, here are a couple drawings by KL, and you can see that the left side of the faces here are distorted. Um, and they also, one question that sometimes comes up in face processing is, are the front of cars processed by the face processing system? And at least for patient KL here, it looks like not, because when KL drew this car, he drew it beautifully. There was no distortion at all. Um, so this was a, a, a face selective distortion that he was experiencing. Um, they showed KL um, faces, um, famous faces that were combined at the vertical midline and asked KL to recognize the two faces. I have no idea who either of these people are, uh, but they must have been famous in Britain 30 some years ago. Um, I can recognize Paul McCartney here. That's the one I can recognize here. Um, but so they, they showed, um, they also showed KL faces in which he was only seeing one half. So it's not these chimeras that I just showed you on the previous uh, slide. And here's some data just showing you that the KL had a much tougher time recognizing the left half um, than the right half of the stimuli. And that was whether they were upright or whether they were inverted. Um, and same goes, they tested him at a later time um, in 1985. And again, he had more trouble with these left half stimuli than the right half stimuli. Note here with these left half stimuli, it's a different part of the face when you invert it and for what they're calling left half stimuli. Um, and so this doesn't appear to be a face centered um, impairment that, that KL has, but instead it's a stimulus centered impairment. Um, so that's a lot like what we were seeing with neglect dyslexia there. And so it appears it might be a stimulus centered um, deficit. There are a couple other cases of hemi-PMO that also have uh, a little bit of evidence for stimulus center representations. Um, so here was a case uh, of a, a Japanese patient who had hemi-PMO. You can see the drawing. So the distortion is on the right side of the face. Um, and then they showed this patient faces at different uh, picture plane orientations. And what you can see is there was always this shift um, on the right side of the face regardless of the, the uh, orientation of the face. That's consistent with the stimulus center representation. This was the only sort of manipulation they did though that gave us any insight into the nature of the, the distortion that this patient had. And here's another Japanese case. And this person, if you show them this face, 
they see a distortion of the left eye. Here, when this face was shown, it was the left eye and the, the left side of the mouth. Um, and here they showed different stimuli to this patient. And what you can see is in all cases, it's always over here on the left side, um, regardless of how the face was presented. So fits with a stimulus-centered impairment. Um, now, what about face-centered representations? Um, so um, with a, with a face-centered representation, um, what, one, what one does is the representation comes in and then that, that uh, representation is gonna be fit to a template, regardless of the viewpoint or the size, the position of that face. And by doing that then, um, that makes it easier to try to recognize that face. Because imagine you've got a number of faces in memory that are all stored in the same fashion. You fit that incoming representation to the template, and then you're better able to match the incoming percept to the memories of faces that you've got. Um, and um, okay, I'm kind of saying this quickly. And this, this approach is, is used in a number of uh, models of human face processing. And it's also a common approach within computer face recognition systems. Um, but there's very little evidence. Uh, when we were working on our paper, I was hoping there was going to be, you know, a good number of papers that we could point to as evidence for face center representations. It was a stretch to find really good evidence for that. Um, but so here's the data from patient AD. So AD, as far as anybody knows, had perfectly normal face perception. And then um, when he was 59, he was um, sitting around at home watching TV. And he noticed that the uh, right side of the faces on TV were distorted. Uh, in particular, it was the right eye, the nose, and the corner of the mouth. It looked like as if they were melting. Um, uh, so he, he mentioned uh, Dali paintings as um, something that was kind of similar to what he was experiencing. Those distortions have, have persisted. Now it's, it's either five or six years that patient AD has been um, living with these and he finds them quite unpleasant. He doesn't like looking at faces. And so as a result, we, we tried to limit the number of faces that we showed him. He's not aware of any distortions to objects or any body parts. And neuropsychologically, he, he's fine. He's no general cognitive impairments, um, et cetera. Um, interestingly, and like a lot of other PMO cases, um, he does fine on tests of facial identity and expression. Although in, in both those types of tests, we were showing him the full face and not just the half face that he has the distortions to. And like so many um, PMO cases, he's got a lesion to the left splenium. It's a um, quite selective lesion to the splenium there. Um, you can see it here, there's a little black there, there in that slice there. Um, and so he's got, a, he's got difficulty passing information from one hemisphere to the other. Here are some of his distortions. Um, so he's Portuguese, so any Portuguese speakers can read these. But um, so what this is, translates to is everything is falling on the right side. The right side is longer and tighter. Right lips, nose and eyes, everything lower. That's what I normally see. There's always something that fails by the nose. The nose is going up. Typically everything is going down. So this is a not his standard sort of distortion. He says, I can't see the lips equally well, right eye is falling. Um, so we showed um, patient AD 20 faces, 16 photographs, um, four line drawing faces. And we also showed him 20 non-face stimuli. Um, and we just looked, how often did he report a distortion when we showed him these faces? And he showed distortions for 17 of the 20 um, human faces that we showed him. In two of the, the faces that he failed to see, I shouldn't say failed, didn't see distortions for, um, the, uh, the right side of the face was not visible because it was a full profile. Um, and um, then there was one case, it might've been this one, one stimulus, it might've even been this one, where the whole right side of the face was visible, but for some reason he didn't see a distortion on that one. Um, and then non-faces, you can see he didn't see any distortions in any of those stimuli. Um, so then the, the um, question that um, 
we uh, focused on in our report on patient AD was trying to understand what, what type of reference frame is generating the distortion um, that is affecting AD's perception of faces. And we considered three different alternatives. The first is a retina-centered um, reference frame. So here, if somebody's got hemi-PMO, um, this is gonna be the red here is the right side of the face that they're seeing the distortion on. Um, if it's retina-centered, our hypothesis was, well, the face is gonna be seen as distorted. Any part of the face that's in the right visual field is gonna be seen as distorted. So if we shifted the face out here to the periphery, the whole face would be distorted. On the other hand, if we shifted George's face to the left, the face wouldn't be distorted at all. Um, if it was stimulus centered, on the other hand, it's always gonna be the right side of the stimulus and not a particular set of facial features. So um, here, George, the right side of George's face is distorted. And here, it's the face on the right-hand side, but now a different set of facial features is the opposite set of facial features. And then for the face-centered representation, the prediction is, well, it's gonna be limited just to these facial features and not to these facial features. So for example, if we turn the face upside down, it's still gonna be the same facial features that are distorted in patient AD. Um, and we did tested that in three different ways. Uh, or these different predictions in three different ways. The first was simply presenting the faces in different parts of the visual field while patient AD fixated centrally. Um, and all we did was ask AD, where are you seeing, or are you seeing distortions on these faces and where are you seeing them? And um, AD saw distortions both to faces presented in the left visual field and to the right visual field. Um, and keep in mind, if it was, if it was the right visual field that was, you would expect it was gonna be the right visual field where you're gonna see a greater percentage of trials with distortions. But in fact, I mean, these are non-significant difference. I just didn't want somebody to think that sort of this was a, there was something going on here. Um, and he, he saw the features always sort of in the same spot on the face on the right side. So we can rule that out, but th that data is consistent with both a stimulus-centered representation and a face-centered representation. So we presented half faces uh, to patient AD, either the left half or the right half. And uh, the prediction here, if it's a stimulus-centered representation, it's gonna be the right side of the, this half face or the right side of this half face. And um, whereas with a face-centered representation, the prediction is it's just gonna be this half of the face and not this half of the face. And here's the data. Um, so he saw distortions in almost all of the right halves um, and in only, I believe it was just one of the left halves that he saw it in. And as I recall, it was the, just a little bit of the nose here where there was a distortion for that. So these results clearly fit with the face-centered uh, interpretation. And then the last data that we presented for patient AD, um, we presented faces at different picture plane orientations. Uh, so upright 90 degrees, fully inverted, and then 270 degrees. And um, so what I'm showing you here in this plot is the number of trials on which patient AD reported a distortion. Um, you can see he saw, that he saw a distortion in 100% of the upright and the inverted trials. Um, and then if we look at the 90 degree and 270, you know, there was about three quarters of the trials he's seen a distortion on. And then the really critical question is, um, where is it that he's seeing these distortions when we're showing him these faces at different orientations? Because that's what allows us to discriminate between the stimulus-centered and the face-centered uh, predictions. And what we found is that nearly every time um, we showed him these faces, at these different orientations, he saw the, the distortion on the same part of the face. So this is the part of the face that he sees the distortion on upright. Well. When we show it to him at 90 degrees, he's still seeing the distortion here in this portion of the face. If it was stimulus centered, the expectation would be this would be the division and he'd be seeing it uh, here on the right side of the face. At 180 degrees, 100% of the time he saw it now on his left-hand side, but which are the right facial features. And then at 270, um, most of the time he saw it up here in this part of the face. There were two trials or three trials 
in which he saw it over here on the nose. I think there was a mouth and maybe a nose um, distortion here. But the great majority of them were, were consistent with the face-centered predictions. Um, and so that allows us to rule out the stimulus-centered account and leaves us with the face-centered account as the, the best explanation. So it appears that um, representations for patient AD are going into a template, they're getting fitted into there, and then the right side of that template um, is distorted um, and that affects faces at all or different orientations. Um, and so what we conclude from patient AD's results is that you know, at some point in the face system, faces appear to be aligned to a template. Um, and that's regardless of you know, the view that you're seeing the face from, the size of the, the, the face stimulus, or even the orientation of the stimulus, which was a surprise to me. Um, we see from his data also that representations of the left and the right halves of the faces are dissociable uh, because he can see one perfectly fine and the other he can't see well. Um, so the fact that his, his um, distortions result from a splenium lesion, that suggests that we've got, that we have face-centered representations of the, at least the right half of the face, maybe the left half as well, are present in both hemispheres because he's unable to transfer them from one hemisphere to the other. We can't, we don't know which hemisphere sort of they originate in and are, he's attempting to transfer them. Um, but my guess would be, and you could probably guess this from my, uh, slide earlier in the talk, my expectation is that he's having difficulty transferring that uh, representation of the right half of the face from the left hemisphere over to the right hemisphere. Um, then more speculatively, we might say that the, the left and right halves are joined together in right fusiform uh, face area. There's um, a fair amount of evidence suggesting FFA as a hub for the face processing system that brings information together um, from different parts of the visual field and, um, and different hemispheres. And I'd mentioned earlier, one of the surprises for me is the similarity that we're seeing in the distortions for upright and inverted faces. Um, there's lots of evidence indicating that upright faces and inverted faces are processed in qualitatively different ways at some points within the visual system. Um, but his findings indicate that at least at some point, in the process, um, they both rely on the same sort of face-centered template. And um, this is consistent with um, some um, uh, suggestions that Morris Moscovich has made about the way inverted faces are processed. Morris thinks that they're initially processed separately from upright faces, and then they're brought together later on in the process. Um, and then sort of stepping back, um, one of the things I find interesting about this data is that it suggests that word and face processing, even though they sort of appear to be different pipelines, um, they appear to be relying on similar levels of representation. They first got this um, stimulus-centered stage, and then later on, they've got a uh, either word-centered or face-centered stage of representation. Um, now, there are a number of future questions, and we're, my lab right now is trying to find more people with, with full face PMO and hemi PMO. Right now we're working with three people, um, hopefully a fourth here um, soon. So um, th there, there are, I mean, I think they're very rare, but there are people out there with hemi PMO. Um, and so hopefully we'll be finding uh, more individuals soon. One of the things that we're, we're doing and hope to do more of is do more testing with people with hemi PMO to see if we find further evidence for stimulus-centered and face-centered representations. And um, we've been working with a, a guy named Nagel, or what, that's his stage name, Nagel, um, who has hemi-PMO that affects the right side of the face. And um, this is data we just very recently collected. My student just put it into a figure um, yesterday. Um, but his results demonstrate a face-centered distortion. And so Sarah, ran Nagel on a very similar set of tests that we ran patient AD on. So here's data from Nagel showing uh, whether he sees a distortion when faces presented either in the right visual field or the left visual field. And you can see visual field doesn't matter. 
um, here's left half of the face versus right half of the face. Again, he only sees it for the right half of the face. And then here are when faces are presented at different picture plane orientations. And he sees the distortion in every single stimulus that we presented to him at all, all four of these different orientations. And then which side of the face is it? I shouldn't say which side of the face, that's not specific enough. Is it the right side features sort of regardless of their orientation where he's seeing the distortions? It is in all cases. Um, and in these cases here where he wasn't sure at 180 degrees, he just wasn't sure whether he was seeing a distortion or not. He felt like he was, but he, he did, didn't feel specific enough to be able to say uh, which features were distorted. Um, and so his data clearly fits with a face-centered distortion. We still don't have um, sort of strong data indicating that um, stimulus-centered representations can be involved in hemi-PMO, but um, hopefully we'll see that if we can find more people. Um, other questions we're interested in, of course, is you know, where are these stimulus-centered and face-centered representations located and when are they generated? Um, and I'd mentioned earlier that um, people with PMO and, and um, hemi-PMO often don't have any difficulties with face recognition and other sorts of, of, of um, face judgments. And um, that raises an interesting question that, you know, is our awareness of faces dependent on different representations than those that we use to make judgments about faces? So maybe I see a distorted face, but that's a very different representation than, than the one I'm using to say, ah, that's Sharon there. Um, and so we're interested in trying to look at this. The way I see this is kind of similar to say a, a Milner and Goodale dissociation between perception and action, if that is, if it's real, we don't know that it's real, of course, but um, where you know one can carry out actions perfectly normally, even though perception is severely impaired. Um, this is a question I feel like these distortions should sh shed some light on how faces are coded at a really fine grain level. I haven't figured out what that is yet, but um, it seems like it, it must reveal something about the way that faces are represented. So I'm gonna keep thinking about that. Um, and then the last question, I'll show you an example here, is you know, which stimuli do and which stimuli do not produce distortions? And this is something that we've seen um, in Nagel, whose data I just showed you where we can cover parts of the face and he'll no longer see a distortion. Um, I'm gonna show you, this is data from patient AS. She's the, the case with full face PMO who I had some quotes from earlier. Um, one of the things that patient AS told us is that she feels like it, it's asymmetries in faces that cause her distortions to begin and then they increase from there. So for example, she'll say, wow, the eyebrows on that person are really asymmetric and that's where the distortion began. So Sarah presented her with asymmetric and symmetric faces um, and just asked her, do you see a distortion? So really simple question. And um, what, what Sarah found is that every single time she showed her an asymmetric face, um, patient AS saw a distortion. When we showed her these symmetric faces, she didn't see a distortion. Um, Similarly, um, Sarah has say covered up half of the face. Um, and so that only say this half of the face is visible. AS does not see a distortion at all there. And we can even, Sarah's sort of getting to run some experiments where she can slowly reveal the face to see when that distortion becomes apparent. Um, and as I recall, it's sort of somewhere along the eye line here. If this part of the face is, cut, is, is occluded, patient AS won't see a distortion over here on this side. Similarly, um, if a face is rotated um, so that one is seen sort of more of the profile of one side or the other, there's a point at which AS no longer sees distortions. Um, so, uh, and with, with patient, uh, with Nagel as well, we see something pretty similar to this. And so there's some really interesting things going on in terms of the amount of stimulus that's necessary uh, for, to, to generate the distortions. Um, so I'll stop there. Let me just um, thank my collaborators. So George Almeida, um, who we're still working with, um, with some of these other cases. And then Sarah Harold, my PhD student, who, um, who's done 
uh, the great majority of this work and also has a project with Sharon. She and Sharon met up in New Jersey to test a patient. Um, and so I'll stop there and I'm, I'm very happy to, to try to answer questions. Um, Brad, thank you very much. I want to ask everybody first to uh, unmute yourself and uh, give uh, a big applaud to Brad. This was a very stimulating talk. Wonderful and exciting. I myself have a few questions. So I'll just start with the one or two and then um, I'll let others also ask. So one thing I wanted to ask was you mentioned in the reports that, I mean, some of it, it sounds like uh, the um, distortions are dynamic as if there is some motion to it. And I'm wondering if this means in some way that, um, I don't know, the dynamic uh, phase system rather than the mm. structure, uh, structural aspects are the ones that are more involved. Okay, just a thought. And another question I have is with respect to the fibers that you mentioned that seem to be... Um, related to that. So I'm wondering if you can look at the location of the fibers and even try in neurotypical um, uh, individuals to try to see where they actually lead to. I mean, if you do DTI in uh, normal individuals and, and look if this, for example, leads to the OFA or to the FFA, these fibers, which, which areas do they connect? Uh, I mean, I, I assume that it's part of the fibers that connect, uh, you know, uh, just the two hemispheres, but it might be interesting to see if it's between the uh, areas that seem to be yeah, yeah, OFA-ish yeah, yeah. or FFA-ish. Just a thought, uh, exciting result. Okay. okay, I'll stop here. And, uh, Thanks. Um, uh, let me just apologize too. I'm sorry if there was much noise during my talk here. There was uh, oh. more activity in my kitchen than I would have preferred. Um, uh, <laughs> no. Your first question, was asking, oh, about dynamic Motion, faces. Emotion, yeah, dynamic yeah. Aspects. So um, one of the things, I, we, I mean, the, the patients see distortions in both static and dynamic faces. And one of the things that's been challenged for us, we're working with a guy down in Boston now, who, when he sees distortions in daily life, and it doesn't happen that often, but when he, he maybe sees them three times a week or something like that, he'll be looking at a face and imagine kind of the whole face is cropped and then it shifts down and to the right. Um, and yet it's been very difficult for us to elicit that sort of distortion in him with static faces. And so then we, Sarah tried to present um, faces in motion, hoping that that, that might do it. And that didn't, unfortunately, that didn't seem to do the trick either. One of the really interesting things about his case, it almost seems like there's a difficulty with anchoring the face to the, to the larger head in that when he's, he's most likely to have distortions when he sees bald people. I mean, bald men is who we're talking about in most cases. And so the inner face just doesn't seem to be anchored properly. Um, do, do, do we see sort of, more engagement with the lateral face areas, those that respond you know, more to dynamic stimuli? We don't know, but that's, a, that's an interesting question. And it would be nice to look at. Uh, we do have some data from patient AS from back our 2014 paper. Um, we found that there was a, a relationship between the intensity of our distortions and the univariate response within face areas. Um, and I think it was true for both ventral and some of the lateral areas, but I, I could look at that more closely. Then your second question, oh, DTI, fiber, yes. Um, so yeah, in George's original paper about patient AD, um, he, I mean, we've included a little DTI data in her, um, in the, the report about her, we, we didn't focus on it. We didn't say try fiber tracking in normal participants to see where those fibers ended up. We were just able to show in patient AD where her lesion was. Um, but George had some functional connectivity data um, that he had collected from patient AD that suggested that there was a reduction in the connectivity between left OFA and right FFA in the patient relative to the controls. Now, one of the, the problems with our limitations with that was that the controls were all college age or young anyway, whereas patient AD was 60 some. Um, and so we didn't feel real confident about that data, but I think that that's a nice approach. And I like your idea about trying to do the fiber tracking 
within the normal participants. I mean, I've never thought much about the corpus callosum, but I find it interesting to think about the fact that this data suggests that there are sort of, you know, that there's a real organization to the corpus callosum, and it makes perfect sense that it's it's organized in a uh, manner. But suggesting that you know you've got a, a section of the the splenium in which you've got you know neurons that are carrying face information and not other sorts of information. But it's just not the way I'd thought about corpus callosum before. Yeah, I'll send you a paper showing a really nice organization uh, in the fibers in the V1 fibers between right and left hemisphere. So it's really consistent. Uh, but yeah, we'll talk about that later. Right. Um, open for questions. Okay, uh, can Hi, you hear me? Uh, sorry, yes, Ian, uh-huh. Okay, um, there's a few uh, items which seem to be quite interesting with what I've seen with prosopic metamorphopsia. First of all, we found that motion on the uh, patient themselves uh, created, in some cases, the uh, metamorphopsia. So it could be either the head movement of the patient looking at the object or the person, or alternatively, uh, the uh, movement of the uh, person they're viewing, both in a lateral and a, a becoming closer terms. The other thing is the three-dimensionality of the image also seemed to have a major effect in some cases. So showing pictures, is, is there any problem with showing pictures rather than using real faces and real people uh, to, to actually assess? It wouldn't surprise me if there is. Yeah, I agree. We would, I mean, it's been great working on Zoom with these with these people with PMO because it's easy to do, especially if somebody's say in South Africa like Nagel is, um, but it would be wonderful to be in a room with them because I think three-dimensional faces might bring out more of the distortions. I'll send you some videos. Great, thanks okay. Ian. Yeah. Ian but I, don't, I don't know how many people are familiar with Ian, but Ian has probably, worked with more people with PMO than anybody else in the world would be my guess. So that's, that's where this is coming I, from. I guess I've done about 400. <laughs> At a guess. But, but, but the one interesting thing that I find with them is that it's variable on the same person. You know, that, that's the bit I find a bit difficult. I said, I said, I've got a model which I think may make sense of it, but it's only a model at this stage. Did I, I don't see it. I saw a hand was raised, but I don't know who's Galia, hand. Galia, uh, Ron, just a second. Galia was, uh, Galia, would you like to unmute yourself? Yeah, hi, hi, thank you. For, it was really interesting. Um, um, I just, the, the descriptions that, that you uh, read at the beginning of your talk just reminded me of the descriptions from other studies with, uh, stimulation of the FFA, like the Pervisi studies and, and some others. And it's just, I was wonder, wondering, you know, whether this is just kind of a coincidence and you can get the stem distortions by stimulating the system and by lesioning, you know, connectivity, or do you think these are different phenomena um, or whether you did have a chance to look kind of closer at potential lesions in, in the FFA in, in your patients? Um, yeah, I think that's a really um, astute observation. And so we're working on a review about PMO right now. Sarah's writing it. And um, we're going to have a section there that um, tries to relate the stimulation studies that have been done to what's been found in PMO. Um, and I mean, it's the, the connections are pretty speculative at this point. Um, but one of the things that we're noticing is there does seem to be this relationship again between the hemisphere in which there's stimulation and the half of the face that's actually affected. It's often hard to sort of understand exactly what's distorted in the stimulation papers. One of the big difficulties is left and right is not often well specified. And so they might refer to left and right the whole time, but you don't know whether left is on the, the right or left right is on the left. Um, but I think that there might be some real parallels between the sort of distortions you get in stimulation and what you see in, in PMO and hemi-PMO. Thanks. It's gonna be interesting to read this review. <laughs> Thanks. Question? Yeah, it, yeah, Rafi. Um. 
Great talk, very interesting. I'm Thank curious, you. if you ask them to imagine a face, do they see distortions? Yeah, <laughs> I don't know the answer to that. I've wondered about that myself. I'm going to put that on my list to, to, to ask them. <laughs> Juan, do you want to uh, ask? Yes, uh, first I would like to share my admiration to Mr. Ian Jordan who attended this talk. I, 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 I would like to recommend uh, to watch his, his uh, YouTube films uh, where he works with uh, children with uh, a process of metamorphosia. And uh, I saw some of, some of these patients myself. Uh, I had the privilege and I would like to comment, sir, if I may, that I think that for some of these, especially children, the face per perception might be aversive. I mean, uh, it, it might be extremely unpleasant. Yes. And also, um, I have noticed, uh, again, according to the work of Ian Jordan, who is present here, that utilizing color lenses can substantially uh, uh, diminish some of the aversion and uh, you, you can also see improvement in eye contact, for example, in some of the, these patients. Uh, so I just want, I just wonder if you, if you pay notice to the clinical intervention, intervention, especially in color. Was that directed to me or to Ian? Um, to you mainly, because uh, I didn't notice it in your presentation. Maybe I missed it, but I didn't notice uh, this part. Yeah, no. So I didn't present any thing regarding color, but we have been trying to look at that. So um, somebody who's worked with Ian, uh, a, a, a visual vision therapist here in the US, um, first mentioned this to me maybe four or five months ago, that she had had success with um, colored lenses and PMO. And I got to be honest, I was skeptical when she told when she said this to me. And um, then we used, uh, we, we didn't use colored lenses, but we presented faces in different colors on people's Zoom screens. And we also found the effects that she had suggested we would find. And these were with patients that um, had not, had no contact with her. So they were totally independent. Um, but we're trying to collect more data to look at this issue uh, right now to um, try to better understand what's going on. Can I put in there? Of course. Uh, the way we do it is we actually separate the retinal cone cell pathways. And that's really important. Uh, and what we do is work with timing. Uh, the timing of color is absolutely critical on this. And you can't just use color because you have the things like the dominant wavelengths and all the other things. It's very, very difficult to use color extremely well, but you might get some effect using basic color. But we have instrumentation where we can actually uh, essentially just separate the LMS pathways. By doing that, then if you separate the LMS pathways and then recombine them within color space, that's when you get the big results. And some of the results are absolutely astonishing. Yeah, in fact, there's a YouTube video, maybe you're familiar with it, that, uh, that Ian has, has published that he just sent me last week that um, there's a, a young girl sort of looking at her, her I think in a, a reflection of her own face yes. in different colors and their dramatic effects. In actual fact, it's, it's very, uh, uh, the one thing I would say with you is that the prosopagnosia and the prosop, and the prosop metamorphopsia, they often occur in the same people, but, they're off, but it's the visual side of it, but it's hard to, to get to it unless you use uh, univariance. It's really very, very difficult to do it otherwise. Okay, we, we need to talk more. I think we do. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll call out now because I've said enough today. <laughs> Um, Brad, there are more, there are a few questions in the chat that have been directed to me, okay. but I'll direct them to you. Uh, so one of them is if they see distortions of their own face in the mirror. And I assume that's more, that sounds like, uh, the video of this girl watching her face. Uh, so if they look at themselves in the mirror, do they see, um, a distortion? That's one question. And another one is about dreams. If the faces mm. and dreams are also distorted or... <laughs> yeah. Um, the first question, I almost mentioned that patient AD, after he first saw the distorted faces on TV, he went into his bathroom and then looked in the mirror and saw the same distortion on his, on his own face. Um, 
this reminds me that there's one very interesting case there some Dutch neuropsychologists worked with somebody who saw distortions only on familiar faces, didn't see them on unfamiliar faces. Um, and um, just two weeks ago, I was reading the Landy and Freivald new paper about area TP. That's an area that responds selectively to familiar faces. Made me wonder if that's sort of the region in which that distortion was being generated. Um, the question about dreams is similar to Rafi's question uh, about imagining faces. I don't know the answer. Um, really interesting question. Yeah, definitely. Um, additional questions? I wanted to ask um, as well, I mean, I understand that if they see, do they um, experience different uh, magnitude of um, distortions if it's in a 3D world versus uh, 2D pictures? Does it make a difference, or whether it's uh, it's the same for them? My, you know, we don't have formal data, mm -hmm. but my impression is that they're more likely to experience it with a three D face, or at least some of the the, wow. the patients that we have worked with. I don't even want to call them patients because you know these are people who are living perfectly normal lives. They've just often just got this one little tweak. Um. An additional question is uh, what you describe, I mean, apart from what Ron said about children with this condition, which I'm not sure if, I mean, because you didn't, it sounds, it sounded like um, all the cases you, you described were people who have this condition in, uh, from acquired cases. Um, and I wonder if this is something that, I mean, people know about this. I mean, the people or the patients or the individuals know about this because they didn't have that and then it developed. I mean, do you think if somebody has that, let's say, uh, I don't know if it can happen in a developmental fashion, but if it does, then why would they actually know that it's an issue? Yeah. Um, so Ian's probably going to be a better person to ask about this question than I am since he's met more people with PMO. But um, all the people who we work have worked with did not have PMO, and then it came on. Mm -hmm. um, in many, in, in several of these cases, I mean, it's a limited number of cases, but in some of these cases, it's not clear what the event was that caused it. Uh, so the guy down in Boston, one day, maybe 18 months ago or so, he was looking at a particular face on a dating app, and it just started moving on. him. And ever since then, he's seen faces as distorted from time to time. He'd never had experienced that before. He isn't aware of any event that might have caused it. Um, patient AS, who, who has full face distortions, um, she had a pretty hard blow to the head, closed head injury, maybe 18 months before she started experiencing distortions. But is it connected? We don't really have any idea. It's certainly interesting whether it can arise, whether there's a developmental form. And I think that's true for neuropsych sort of mm -hmm. conditions in general. Are there develop, uh, is there always a developmental form and an acquired form? And if not, sort of why not? Um, there was one developmental prosopagnosic who I tested many years ago, a guy in Brooklyn who, um, I, he, I'm pretty sure he used to see distortions to, to fe features. And um, I tried to email him last week and his email wasn't working, but that, I'm trying to look into that. Interesting. I've seen a lot uh, most of mine were developmental. Okay. Really? Yes. Uh, and they know, and ha so how, why do they come to the situation where they actually think it's abnormal and they report it? It's usually part of a whole range of tests we were doing. Uh, essentially what, what happened was we were seeing principally sort of autistic children and the autistic children, a very high proportion of them have visual processing problems of one form or another. And we were, uh, gradually, we realized there was faces uh, in a lot of cases they're having difficulties with. Some of it would be prosopagnosia, but some of it would be other forms of facial recognition problems. And as we were able to flip it around and change it so it would actually work and stop uh, using univariance, which it does really work well, then in that, in which case, uh, we you know, could assume that it was developmental. And there's obviously forms which can actually be treated in that case. I suspect it's probably not the case in, uh, should we say, acquired. I think there may be a different ballgame on that. 
that, that was actually much rarer from our point of view <laughs> than the <laughs> developmental ones. So, it's, so we were dealing with different things, really. But if you're dealing with autistic you. children, you've got to use this. You've got to look at that. Thank you. Um, Brad, there was an additional question in the oh. chat, which was directed to me, but maybe now uh, it was written to you. Do you want uh, Do you want to check the chat or do you want me to read some question that was written in the chat? Is it from Emily Cunningham? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, um, it's I, my if I, if I'm understanding the question correctly, it's a little hard to process it here in front of everybody. But um, I think that it would depend on whether it's a stimulus-centered distortion or a face-centered distortion, as to whether it would be the same side of the face or not. And Emily, if you just want to come on and ask me, maybe it would be easier for me to understand than trying to read it. Okay. Um, okay. Maybe she has an issue with the audio. Um, Ron, I see there's another raised hand. Yeah. Ron, do you want to ask uh, another question? Yes, I, I think that uh, there is a subject which is uh, might be relevant, and it's the concept of eye contact. Mm -hmm. Some people find it really hard to maintain eye contact, and and for. Many, many parents tell their, tell their children, especially in clinical population, look into my eyes when, I, when I'm talking to you. Uh, and I think that it is possible that some of those children who find it hard to look in, in one other eye, it might be somehow related to the subject that we are talking about. Again, because if you're looking at, at a person's face and that person's face is distorted, it might be very, very frightening, especially if you're if you're young. Yeah, I think that makes perfect sense. I mean, say Nagel, the, the guy who we mentioned earlier, I and mean, he talks about how um, disturbing faces can be when he when he looks at them. Um, you know, this is a, a man who's 36, 37 years old. Um, AS, the woman with full face distortions, she doesn't like to look at people's faces. She finds it aversive. She tends to look off to the side a little bit when she's interacting with people, um, even though she knows that people don't like doing it, but it's just a better way for her to deal with the situation. Yeah, and those specific people, are, I think, are the ones who are going to benefit most from uh, color treatment. Interesting. They do benefit. They do. Um, if there are um, um, no more questions, Brad, I want to thank you a lot for this exciting and you uh, mind opening uh, concept or, you know, <laughs> um, very exciting. And thanks for joining us again. Um, thank you all for uh, joining us. We're going to be taking a break, coming back in the beginning of October. I think the first talk we have, we have is with uh, Margaret Livingston, but I have to check the calendar to be more specific, and I'll send out uh, details and invitations. Um, so have a lovely summer. I can say uh, cold summer, but some people would probably like it warm. So, uh, <laughs> um, Thanks again so much, and um, we'll be in touch. Okay. Thanks a lot for inviting me, Sharon, and thanks for all the feedback, everybody. Great. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.